This is Maria Van Vakenu, and she held the federal seat of Cortwell for over 20 years. She retired before the 2025 federal election, and what was normally a very safe Labor seat became the most complex preference count in Australia's history. And I want to show you how that played out in detail. The seat of Corwell is in Victoria, in outer Melbourne, and it's always been held by the Labor Party. It's been a very safe seat for them. So much so that in 2019, Labor won the seat on first preferences alone. In 2001, Maria Van Vakenu entered Parliament for the first time. And well over 20 years later, she decided to retire before the 2025 federal election. A whole bunch of candidates came out to try and win the seat. You had the major parties, including a former advisor to Maria Van Vakenu, Bassam Abdo, who was the Labour candidate. Then you had the Greens and a whole bunch of other minor parties and independents. But unlike in previous elections, where most of the votes went to the major parties, in 2025, more people voted for minor parties and independents than they did for Labour and the Liberals combined. And this meant that the Australian Electoral Commission had the difficult task of figuring out how the preferences flowed to see who won. We'll come back to the seat of Colwell in a bit, but let's just run through how winners are decided in elections. Some other countries, like the UK and the US, have a system called first past the post, which is a fancy way of saying whoever gets the most first preference votes wins. The majority of people may not want that person, but if they get more votes, then they still win. In Australia's federal system, we have preferential voting, which I think is much better, and ensures that your vote is not wasted. In the House of Representatives, for example, everyone fills out the little green sheet, and you must number all the boxes from most preferred to least preferred candidate. This order is critical. When the votes are counted, if any candidate has more than 50% of the first preference votes, that means that the majority of the people in that electorate put that person as number one on the ballot, and they win. But that isn't what usually happens. Instead, if no one has the majority of first preference votes, then we go to the second count. In this second round, the candidate with the least number of votes gets eliminated, and their votes then go to the other candidates, depending on how those people filled out their preferences. And if there still isn't a winner, this process keeps going until there is. This means that your vote is never wasted and can allow people to vote for parties who are less likely to win, but also still sway who the ultimate winner is. Candidates may give you a guide on how to vote, but preferences are chosen by each voter on the green sheet. So let's go back to Corwell, because in that count, there had to be 12 rounds to figure out the winner and that's what took so long for the results to be confirmed. The Electoral Commission has released the raw data for Corwell, so I've turned that into a graphic to make it easier to visualise. This is how the first preferences landed. You can see straight away that Labour is way ahead, but they only have 30% of the votes at this stage. Remember that under our system, the person who wins isn't the one who has the most first preference votes. It's whoever gets over 50%, or a majority of votes. You'll also notice that Carly Moore is in third place, quite a bit behind Labour and the Liberals. Carly Moore was one of the higher profile independents. She was a local council mayor and apparently was previously in the Labour Party. She quit the party to run in Corwell as an independent. Okay, so let's see how this plays out. In round two of the count, the candidate Morgan Peach got the lowest number of votes, so he was eliminated, and his votes were distributed according to the preferences of those 487 people. Then round 3 knocks out the next candidate with the lowest vote count. In round 4, Clive Palmer's candidate gets eliminated. A lot of these votes go to One Nation, but also quite a lot to Carly Moore, the Independent. So much for the millions and millions of dollars spent in advertising. In the next few rounds, we still don't have anyone at over 50%, but you'll see that Carly Moore is starting to gain traction as preferences flow through. In 
In round 8, we see the One Nation candidate getting knocked out. Interestingly, most of these votes flow to Kylie Moore, with a lot also going to the Liberal Party. By round 9, we're getting massive amounts of votes flowing, which can start to really change things up. Another independent gets eliminated, and over 7,000 votes are allocated to the remaining candidates. And most of these 7,000 votes go to the Greens, which now puts them in 4th place, which is above where they started. Round 10 sees over 12,000 votes allocated, and a big proportion of those go to the remaining independent, Carly Moore. And this now puts her in 2nd place, above the Liberal Party, and catching up to Labour. Next up is the Greens getting eliminated, and Labour picks up a boost here, and the Liberals get even further behind. And now we're at the final round, round 12. The Liberal Party, even though they got the second highest first preference votes, are now eliminated, and their 20,000 votes are allocated. Carly Moore takes a large portion of these votes, but it's not enough, and Labour's candidate, Bassam Abdo, wins the seat. It took 12 rounds of counting to get here, and it just shows how important preferences are. No vote is wasted. Well, except for the ballots which are not properly completed, which are called informal votes. In Corwell, there were over 10,000 informal votes, which is over 10%. That's such a high amount. Anyway, I hope that was helpful in visualising how things work, but I'll leave you with an uninterrupted flow of the Corwell count without my commentary ruining it. And thanks for watching.